Yo, what up? This is Deuce. Can you? I'm, I'm trying to record. I'm trying to. Yes, yeah, honey. Yes, yeah, honey. Can you just make sure you charge the um, camera? I'll I'll, I'll, yes, I'll. I'll. Did you stand for the floors to be done? Okay. All right. Um. Ken Johansson is going to be on today to tell us about the draft process, oh. and we. I'm coming, honey, and we're going to talk a little bit about OTAs. Right up after this is Ken Johansson from Hogs Haven. He's a co commander's writer from Hog Haven. Ken Johansson's joining us. Now. Are you doing the same for him? I'm, yeah, I'm doing it for real. Like, what are you? <sighs> this is Hog Farmer Chris in the 2022 Commanders Fan of the Year. Before you listen to Red Zone in the Lab podcast, I want to thank you for your support and bringing awareness to the Hog Farmers Charitable Foundation, which helps children and their families affected by pediatric cancer. You truly make a difference. And with that being said, please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. We're back. Welcome back to Red Zone in the Lab with Deuce. Welcome, welcome back to Red Zone in the Lab podcast. I am Deuce and joining us today. First time guest on the podcast. Uh, he was a writer at Hogs Haven. Ken Johansson. How are you doing today, buddy? Doing good, Deuce. It's good to be with you. Here to talk some football to see what we can expect in this coming season, especially with our draft picks. Yes, most and, and you all see his hat, right? Draft good players, right? If you can do that, you can last a long time <laughs> in the NFL, right? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Before we get into some ball talk, let's go a little bit back. I always like to ask, especially, you know, um, beat writers that come on here, writers that come on here um, that cover the team. I always ask, you know, are you an actual fan of the team? I'm an actual fan of the team. Uh, my fandom goes back to the 1930s and when they moved to Washington uh my family is from virginia and so my grandfather started listening to the radio broadcast of the old uh, redskins games especially when sammy ball came to town so when i was born i was born a redskins fan of course eventually a washington football team fan now commanders fan all the same though yeah for sure um so how long have you been covering the team have you only been writing for the team well uh yeah i've been doing this for about 13 years uh well a little over 13 and it started off with uh burgundy and gold obsession.com you know bgo as it's known mm -hmm. and uh, they're known as bg obsession.com on twitter and yeah, so i've seen I, it yeah yeah seen it. okay yeah and so i started Right. Well, it all happened by accident. I um, they had a contest for the upcoming draft in 2010. I participated in it and I did really well. I tied for first place. I guessed two picks correctly. That was uh, I, I knew that Mike Shanahan was going to draft a running back. He always mm -hmm. does. <laughs> and I said, well, they need more than one running back. So I thought maybe two. So I had Roy Hulu being chosen in the third round. I think he went in the fourth round, but that was a hit. And then I said, I think they'll take Evan Royster of Penn State. Wow, you got it too. <laughs> in the sixth round, I got that one even the round the round correctly. And I said, hey, I'm pretty good at this. And, and of course, future contests, I wasn't so good. But I just started writing a blog there, and they said, we're going to call this um, Burner's Burning Questions because I'm known as Burgundy Burner there, mm -hmm. as well as my handle on Twitter. So that's how it all started. So over about 10 years, I, I wrote blogs for them and uh, did all kinds of things. And then it morphed into writing for Rigo's Rag for six years. Starting in 2017, I wrote up until earlier this year for them. And at that time, it was nothing against anything at Rigo's Rag. I was happy there. But it was time for a change. Um, I felt like I needed new challenges, new directions to go. 
So what I did was I just basically declared my free agency in late March. And I've been thinking about mm -hmm. it since about October. And, and finally, I just woke up one morning. I said, I need to do this. And I had nowhere to go, no, nothing planned. I just resigned from Virgo's Rag. And then to make everything short, because it was a little bit complicated, Scott Jennings, the uh, editor at um, Hogshaven, uh, I got a hold of him, just letting several people know in various places, you know, what I was doing. Within two hours, I was with Hogshaven <laughs> and the rest is history. And so I brought him for them. What is your most memorable blog? Um, for BGO, um, it was a prediction that I did probably about seven, eight years ago. And well, maybe even 10 years ago, because it was an RG3, is rookie season. So that's actually almost 11 years. Yeah. My goodness, time, fly, time, time flies. <laughs> yeah. So what I did was I made a prediction for the Dallas game, the Thanksgiving Day game. And I said, Washington is going to, you know, everybody was saying Dallas is going to win that game. Um, you know, RG3, it will be brought down to earth. They had a little bit of a winning streak going. And starting to get, you know, um, consideration for the playoffs from all the pundits out there. So I said, I think they're going to do really well down there in Dallas. And RG3 is going to have a great game. Santana Moss will shine, and um, they'll come away with a sizable victory. Now, Dallas did fight back, but uh, Washington took care of business that day. So that was my favorite prediction, that particular blog. Um, and for the other two, I did really don't have anything that stands out. Of course, I've, I've only been at Hogsave in a few months, yeah. and I'm enjoying working there. But with Rigos Ragged, I've worked with some great, uh, wonderful people along the way. Ian Cummings is uh, a draft expert that a lot of mm -hmm. people have on their po podcast. I would love to have him one day. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do that. He'll come. Okay. And um, and I'll tell him. Yeah, please and, do. Uh, <laughs> he used to be one of the editors at Rigos Rag and had a hand in hire me. The other one was Jacob Kanaker, mm -hmm. who's now with Sporting News. So those two guys, I enjoyed, wow. work yeah, I enjoyed working for them. And then we had an, another editor, another editor come along the way, Jerry Trotta, a uh, really good editor. And recently he uh, took another position with um, the same network, the fan sided network, and now blogs for the Dallas Cowboys. So, okay. Hey, what can I say? <laughs> can I say? And now um, the gentleman that's been there as the editor for Rigo's Rag the last few minutes, few months has been Dean Jones. He's he's really he's superb. He's great. I wish I could have been there longer, but again, I felt like it was time for a change. They're in good hands. They really are. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Let's talk a little bit about the draft, right? Mm -hmm. Um why are you why do you love the draft process so much? Because I, I mean I don't know if you love it, but your writings and how you talk about it, when you talk about it, it makes me believe that you love it. I do love it. I love the challenges behind it. And I also accept the humbleness of it because when I do mock drafts and when I have some successes there, I'll toot my own horn, you know? But I've had times when I've totally missed everything. And I'll admit it. I'll put it in the article say, guys, I missed it. That's all there is to it. There was a, a one about three years ago. I kept you know, putting mock drafts out there, and I just didn't get anything right. So the last couple of years have been okay, not bad. But um, now I know a lot of people want to know how I find out about all the team meetings that the commanders have each year. And it's not that I'm an insider or anything like that. It's a process that I discovered about five years ago. And I took about two years playing with it, and it works. So I'll just say that it involves a burner account and going deep into a lot of areas that people, people don't even think about. And so that's why I'm able to come up with all these team meetings, either informal or formal, before draft, you know, the actual draft takes place. 
and um, it you know gives us a window into what the team is thinking about all the draft prospects and especially the positions they're going at. And I just love doing that. And it's a huge challenge, but I'll say that once we get to the month of May and all that's done, I'm burned out. I need, I need a few weeks off. So it's a huge challenge, but I enjoy the process. All right. What I came, what one of your writings and, and what we talked about one time in the space was um, the visits, you know, the, the, when the, the teams, they reach out to the prospects for them to come in and, and they, and they visit, and you kind of saw like a little trend, um, like you were saying, these, these last uh, two years, what was the trend last year? And what was the trend this year? The trend last year, as I recall, was wide receivers. They met with more wide receivers than any position. Now, a lot of people, you know, had those Ohio State receivers, you know, being chosen by Washington. And there goes my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, sorry about that. It's okay. I have a landline and uh, many reasons <laughs> why. I have a cell phone too, but I have to have both. Uh, a- we do too. Like my, 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 my wife... She will not let go of this landline. She will not. So we well, have one too. <laughs> the complex where I live requires it. But oh, okay. all inside, yeah. you know, uh, the, the, during the 2022 process, they met with a lot of wide receivers. But the one they really didn't meet with, it was only a, a couple of informal meetings with Jahan Dotson. So he was not on the radar for a lot of people. And at that point, it just... I didn't know what to think. And um, I said, guys, wide receiver seems to be a real focus for this team. So was it going to be Jamison Williams? That seemed to be the consensus pick. Then all of a sudden they traded down to 16 and they got Jahan Dawson. Of course, the rest is history. Now, also, they put some emphasis on um, defensive end, a little bit on linebacker last year. And so wide receiver was it though. And so in the first round, that's what happened. So it it basically affirmed what they did in in the pre-draft meetings. This year, the uh, two big things that I noticed, the two trends that I noticed were um, offensive tackles, uh, especially all, all the offensive line positions, but offensive tackles and cornerbacks. And for a while, the offensive tackles seemed to be the main focus. But during the last two weeks of meetings that the commanders had, it was cornerbacks. So that was really catching up. And then um, I remember going on the Burgundy Zone podcast with Kyle and Mike and Mike and saying that um, there's two or three cornerbacks that we need to look at. And and Emmanuel Forbes was one one of them that we talked about. So I said, this is a 50-50 thing right now. So um, I think, I really do think if one of those offensive tackles that they really coveted, especially Darnell Wright, had been there at 16, that's who they would have taken. But I think they had an inkling earlier in the day on draft day for first round that the tackles were going to be gone. And we've seen the video where Ron Rivera is riding around in his car and he said, you know, if Emmanuel Forbes is there, uh, we're going to get our guy. So I think they already knew the tackles would be gone. And then at that point, they could probably zero in on Forbes and they did. <clears throat> so um, when the how soon do you start? this process because like we already have mocks just coming out there. I, I know <laughs> here's my, here's what I do each year. Once I get to just after the draft, I kind of turn it off. I, I start focusing on a, more on OTAs, mini camp, rookie camp, the um, training camp preseason and so on. And now this past year was kind of an exception over the years, I've started about mid-October. I would start watching games on Saturdays, especially, you know, I wanted to see all the prospects. I would have my DVR going. So I would spend 
Saturday almost from sun up to, to late at night watching all this. And I would watch the tape during the week. So, you know, it added up. Now, I'm retired, so I can do all that. No right. big deal. So last year, I just felt like there was so much on the line that I started in early September wow. doing that. Now, once I get, once we get uh, into December, I'm really at it. I'm really going at it. I'm really starting to study the prospects now because we're getting a better idea of who they may target, right? Mm -hmm. So once the season's over, once we get to January, my focus is the Senior Bowl, the East-West Shrine Bowl, uh, the Tropical Bowl, um, uh, the Collegiate so Showcase, the HBCU Combine and HBU, HBCU uh, uh, All-Star Game. I'm focusing on all of that. And I mean, I'm really into it. So I'm contacting a lot of people. And if I can, I contact some of the players. Now, a lot of them want to acknowledge me and that's fine. That's not a big deal, but if some of them do, I try to gain a little information if I can, I, without trying to really bother them. So uh, the, that's when it really starts kicking into high gear. And then I get into February, start focusing on the combine and uh trying to wrap up all the you know all the senior bowl and all the all-star bowl games and then you start getting into all the uh formal and informal meetings and then all the way leading up to the draft and as well as the top 30 meetings and what i'll tell you deuce is this the bread and butter of meetings with these prospects for the commanders and any team are the informal meetings the formal formal meetings do happen uh especially the combine the top 30 team visits etc but it's the informal meetings that is the bread and butter and probably where they find out the most about a prospect tell, Jahan, sorry, tell us that tell us like the difference between the two like what's then, informal and what's formal? Yeah, informal meeting, for example, let's say they're at a team pro day. Let's say they're at Ohio State's pro day. And the scouts are there. Maybe the general manager there, Martin Mayhew is there. Maybe even coach Ron Rivera or Jack Del Rio, our defensive coordinator. And they're there. And um, so they may uh, talk to a prospect while all the team pro day is going on for a few minutes. That's an informal meeting right there. Or they may meet them with them briefly after the team pro day is over. Just call them to the side, talk to them a little bit. Whereas formal meetings, let's talk about the combine for a second. A formal meeting, how that's structured is they go into a room. Now you've seen the uh, interview process they had with Emmanuel Forbes. On, uh, the commanders have been putting out these videos and they're super. Yeah. And that was at the combine. So he comes into a room, the NFL locks the door. You have 20 minutes with that player. You don't have 20 minutes and two seconds. You have 20 minutes. And once the 20 minutes is up, the door opens and they've got to come out. You can't keep talking to them. So that's where you do your formal interview with these players. And most of it's done at the combine. Of course, the top 30 visits are considered formal. And the... Um, at Team Pro Day, you can have formal visits. The Senior Bowl is not recognized as formal visits, but they're treated as such. And here's a little secret. Most people don't know this. Some, some do, especially, you know, all the uh, gurus out there. At the Senior Bowl, the teams will meet with every single player at the Senior Bowl. So when a player has, says, I've met with every team, well, of course they have. <laughs> so that makes it, they, makes them sound more important, yeah. but that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, the commanders met with every single player at the Senior Bowl, but that's because that's how they structure it. And in some cases, they meet with some of the players multiple times. Uh, one player they met with a lot of times at the Senior Bowl this year was uh, offensive guard from TCU, I think he was, Steve Avila. And I thought that he was a target. He might have been, 
Uh, of course, they took Quan Martin in the second round. I thought that was going to be a target in the second round. But uh, so I think they had like five or six meetings with him in the senior bowl, and that's wow. fine. Wow. Now, at the combine, it's not just formal meetings, but they can have informal meetings as well. At any of these places, informal meetings is still the bread and butter of the pre or of the pre draft process. Yeah, I would think so. Informal just seems like you know, you catch him coming out of the bathroom or catch him going to his <laughs> car or <laughs> anything yeah, like that. That's true. <laughs> yeah, you know, anything's possible, you know. So, um, I'm surprised. So, like, I, I want to talk about some of the O linemen to see, you know, Ron Rivera's comments about Stromberg and Daniels, especially with Stromberg. Um, day two, one, two player, regardless of where they pick. And, like, we know we used our comp pick for Stromberg, which is at towards the end of the third round, but it's still a third round pick. And I'm expecting for him to contribute in some way, um, not to be called a project. Um, that's like, but how did you feel about Stromberg um, coming into this this draft? I thought he was one of the better centers in the draft, but I felt like this is just my opinion, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but you know, the scouts out there know so much more than me and any of us who are part of the citizens' media, as I like to call it. <laughs> citizens' so, media is cool. Yeah, that's what we are. <laughs> let's admit it. Yeah. And uh, although I will say this, the uh, B reporters for the commanders are generally very respectful to us. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, most of them are, and I like that. So anyway, uh, aside from that, uh, I had Stromberg rated as a fifth rounder. And I thought if they take him in the fourth, I'll be okay with that. When he went late in the third, I was surprised. But I said, maybe they see something there. And now we've learned that Nick Gates is the likely starter starter at center. I think it's a good choice. So does um, Stromberg spend a year studying, you know, what uh, it's all about? Do they think he's going to be all everything in the future? Uh, I would have to think so. But I'm like you. I'd like to see a little more, uh, you know, out of a third rounder in his first mm-hmm. season, at least about halfway into the season, get in there and get some, meaningful minutes in a game but we'll have to see wait and see how it all plays out so as far as Braden Daniels the other choice going to fourth round that's where I primarily had him pegged so I think that was a good choice good position for him to be chosen in yeah um let's talk about uh, a little bit about OTAs um are you are are you there at OTAs because if so I I didn't I, I didn't see you if I would, I would have said hi. Well, I live in Collierville, Tennessee. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I live just outside of Memphis. I, oh, the, yeah. the one thing I can claim about this area is that Memphis is the home in, uh, to the uh, it's the international headquarters for FedEx is here in the Memphis area. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah and, and out of Memphis International, you see those FedEx jets coming and going all the time around the clock 24 7 365 and you see fedex trucks everywhere around here (laughs) and if you see a ups truck around here you think they're lost (laughs) but no i've been down here for about 10 years okay and um i came down here as part of the university of tennessee vanderbilt university hospital system Okay. Because um, it, there's a long story as to how that all worked out, and that's how I ended up in the Memphis area. A Collierville is an eastern outer suburb of, of Memphis, nice area, and I live in a what really amounts to a medical community. It's re- gotcha. they take they take good care of me. That's good. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Ken. It's good to know that. Um, so, will you know we hear what's coming from OTAs and. Um, I guess we could talk a little bit about Sam Howe. Um, mm. So I, I know you, you did. You, you, I'm, I'm sure you did some work on Sam Howe uh, last year and maybe even year before that. Uh, what do you see from Sam Howe? Like, w- what do you think he can be for this team? When you go back to 2022, well, really, um, even before that. 
there was talk about him being the first overall pick in the draft. And it was a real shocker um, that he chose not to come out in 2021. And it surprised me because he lost his wide receivers, uh, one of them being Deami Brown, obviously. And he lost some of his offensive linemen. So I was surprised to see him go back. I thought he was going to enter the draft and definitely be a top 10 pick, if not a top five pick. And there was even talk about him being first overall. But he stayed back. And I was not surprised that he regressed, but it's not because he's a a bad football player. He still did fairly well uh, his last year at North Carolina. But he should have come out the year before. I mean, it's just my opinion. But I was surprised he slipped all the way to the fifth round. Washington had no other choice but to take him when they uh, traded down in the, from the fourth round there mm-hmm. and got those two fifth round picks to pick how, and a few picks later got Cole Turner, I believe. And so I said, well, this is intriguing. I think this is potentially a good thing. So to get to the meat of your question, um, I like what I saw in the final game of 2022. And Dallas was playing for something. They had a chance to have home field advantage at least through most of the playoffs, if not all of it, an outside chance. But still, they had to travel – because of that loss, they had to travel to San Francisco, and they lost out there. I think it was nineteen to twelve. Imagine if they could have had that game at home. I think they wanted to win that game, but Washington was just on fire. They wanted to go out with a bang, and Sam Howell really showed all of his his amazing arm talent and his uh, abilities as a runner. Yeah. Even. Mm-hmm. And so all of it, and he's tough as a runner. He's durable. He's scary as a runner, I think. So I really think there's one key addition this past off season that's going to make all the difference for him. And that's new associate head coach and offensive <laughs> coordinator, Eric Bieniemy. That's why I'm optimistic. And I think a lot of people should be as well. I think this young man is going to have a good season. Will he have a great season? Maybe, maybe not. But if he has a good season, I think it's going to be enough. And so that's what I'm looking for, a good season where he has a good touchdown to interception ratio. And I think um, all three of our receivers, um, uh, all three of our starters are going to have a very good year. Terry's going to be good. John Dotson. Um, I, you know, Curtis Samuel, you know, has always been kind of back and forth these like, last couple of years, but he's someone I think can really shine in the system. As well as Antonio Gibson. Let's not forget him. But a guy that I think could develop, develop as a fourth receiver, and he has rapport with um, Sam Howell, and that's Deami Brown. Yep. <laughs> and if Logan Thomas can get regain his form, this offense is going to be scary. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. Um, like, what do you think? What type of season does this team need to have in order for Ron to keep his job? Oh my goodness! <laughs> they need to make the playoffs. Okay, yeah. Considering what they have, um. Do they need to win a playoff game or two? I would say maybe not. You have a new regime coming in. And if they make the playoffs, I think the regime will say, okay, this is something to build upon. Whether the fans like that or not, they're going to be chomping a bit if they don't win a (laughs) playoff game, right? But I think new ownership is going to look at it differently and say, we're new here. We like that we made the playoffs. Let's build on that. And I think this is going to be a great ownership group, by the way. So I think they're going to be patient with him for at least a year. But if they miss the playoffs and they have, let's say, a record similar to this past year or even a little bit less, 
he could be on the hot, hot seat, but that's 50-50. I don't have a good read on that yet, but we'll have to wait and see how the season unfolds. Yeah, that's what I think. Man, I think we were behind a year. Um, I think if we weren't going through all this ownership stuff, he would have been fired this past year. So yeah, yeah, it, this we have to pretend like we were we got to the wild card and was competitive last year. And this year, I think he has to win a playoff game and yeah. be competitive um, to solidify that job. But some people that don't like Ron, man, if we are, if we do win a game in the playoffs, I don't see yeah. him leaving. So I mean, he. Like, I, I, I don't know what's that going to look out. There's so many questions. Man. Yeah. My best hope is that uh, Ron Rivera realizes that Eric Bieniemy is a very good coach and Eric Bieniemy becomes the head coach. I don't think you make him associate head, head coach and give the offensive, all the offense to him total. You know, he has uh, complete autonomy with that offense now. And you don't just give that to him and don't have a plan for the future. So if after one season, no matter what happens in 2023, if Eric Bieniemy becomes the coach and Ron Rivera heads off into the front office, I think that'd be pretty good. And the reason I say that, that some people will say, you know, Ron Rivera needs to hit the road. Now, come on. I think these last three years, why not ideal is as far as wins and losses. He's changed the culture here of not just the football team itself, but the whole organization. And I think that's saying something. Um, I think fans are the most optimistic I have seen in more than 20 years. And it mm-hmm. all has to do with owner new ownership. Oh, yeah. And it has to do with the the amazing culture change uh, uh, that I didn't know if he could do that, but I would say he has. Oh yeah, I agree. and so I think he, uh, if he can go into the front office in whatever capacity, I think that would be great. And then let Eric be enemy, just take over this team and let him do his magic. That's what I would love. That I, I would love that to Ron and be able to go into the office. I think he's done a pretty good job overseeing um, the draft. I mean, not so much free agency, but free agency, but you know, at least the draft. Um, you know, I can kind of put up our last few ja- drafts against most teams in, in the NFL, and I yeah. think we'll come out with more contributors from these last four drafts. Um, so yeah, okay, Ken. So give me before we go. Give and 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 you know, hopefully, you will come back because I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I really enjoy you, Ken. Well, I appreciate, but, um, you, appreciate you inviting me here, Deuce. Uh, I've really enjoyed this. You're pretty <laughs> awesome. I've enjoyed you in the Twitter spaces and everything. I appreciate that. I can't get there, uh, really in the mornings too much because I'm usually doing medical stuff, but when I'm there, I've always enjoyed it. I appreciate all the things that you do for the fans out there. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Ken. Um, Last question. Give me – get because what I'm doing is um, I usually do spotlight players, like some some players that's kind of on the outside of the 53, but, you know, that you believe can make an impact and sneak into um, the the 53 and be a strong contributor. Who do you have that's outside of – the presumed 53 that you think can be an impact player this year? Well, I don't think he's on the outside, but he's certainly not a starter. And um, he was a special teams guy last year, um, but not one of the best around on special teams. But I think someone who's going to take a major step forward, and it's going to be hard to keep him off the field, and that second-year player, Percy Butler. Yeah, safety. I like it. Yeah, I really think – I think he he's automatically on the team anyway. Mm-hmm. You can't deny the speed he has. My goodness. Yeah. And I think Percy Butler had a hand in getting his old college teammate <laughs> chosen in the seventh round, defensive end, outside linebacker, Andre Jones, who I think is a sleeper. You know, he's a guy to watch, but he, I think he had a hand in getting 
uh, Andre Jones to town. Uh, we chose him in the seventh round. That's a good pick. I like that sneaky good pick. So I think that shows Percy Butler may have a little bit of pull there. And I'm looking for really good things from him uh, on defense, you know, coming in there on certain packages and having a really good impact. And I think he's going to do really well on special teams this year as well. That first is, first Butler is the guy to watch. Yeah, I like that. Last year I had Dirk Forrest. I just thought I had actually I had Dirk Forrest, I had Dijon Harris, and Curtis Hodges. Um, so Good I got choice. I got I got I got one right, and I'm and uh, and Hodges is going back on my list um, this year. But yes, there you have it, Ken Johansson, uh, Commanders writer for Hogs Haven. Um, you can find him on Twitter at Burgundy Burner. You can find him at hogshaven.com. Follow him. Um, you know, he, 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 you, you're like the OG. You're like an OG. You, you got OG status now, Ken. <laughs> well, let me tell you something about that. I turned 65 this year. Uh, I have a 43 year old daughter. <laughs> I don't deny that I'm getting old. And the harsh reality this summer is that I'm getting a lot of stuff in the mail that deals with Medicare. So that t- that seals it right there. <laughs> Let me tell you, brother, when you see stuff coming about Medicare and they're trying to get you to sign up, yeah, you're getting old. <laughs> so I accept it. Oh, oh, man. Thank you so much, Ken, for yes, joining. Sir. Thank you all out there uh, for listening. Thank you for watching. I am Deuce. Remember, do it because you love it, not because it loves you. One beat, one sound, one heart, one love. Thank you for listening to Red Zone in the Lab podcast. Please subscribe to YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Remember, do it because you love it, not because it loves you. One beat, one sound, one heart, one love.